This is a Chronicle podcast, bringing you ideas in the service of medicine. From the Chronicle podcast system, this is the NPC podcast of the National Pharmaceutical Congress for October 19th, 2022. The NPC podcast was created to discuss and consider the purpose, process, and people of the pharma industry during the COVID era. We'll continue the healthcare conversation by answering questions sent by listeners just like you. This program is presented in cooperation with Impress, Canada's next generation commercial partner. The industry is rapidly evolving and Impress is designed to help you evolve with it. Learn more about Impress's tailored best-in-class solutions at www.impress.com. Today, we'll be revisiting some interviews from the NPC Vault and hearing some sage advice from some panelists in the upcoming 16th Annual National Pharmaceutical Congress. Our first speaker who will be at the NPC on November 2nd is Bob McLay, Canadian General Manager of SOBI. Bob will discuss SOBI's vision in the rare disease space, companies working together to help drive policies, and the Canadian environment for precision medicine. SOBI is uh, the largest biotech company um, uh, housed in Sweden. Got an office in Boston and also an office just outside of Toronto. Been around for over 40 years in, in various forms. But the focus has always been on developing and manufacturing innovative therapies for rare disease patients. Our company tagline used to be um, pioneers in rare disease but we evolved that to leaders in rare disease. So that's, that's a place we play, and, and that's what we hope we bring value to people. There's a lot of behind-the-scenes work that most people don't know about. It's not just a matter of, you know, pressing pills and, and mailing them into Canada and having us sell them. You know, there's lots of things to do. You know, fees to Health Canada for regulatory reviews. You've got to think about setting up importation licenses, drug establishment licenses, pharmacovigilance, quality systems. You know, there's a global value dossier that we have to adapt to the Canadian market, which really means, you know, what kind of value are we getting for money? There's fees for health technology assessments with Cadeth and Inez, as you know, building up various other systems like third-party logistics, distribution. Often there's expensive patient support programs to help patients navigate through some reimbursement waters, price negotiations, provincial product listing agreements, all, all that background work it takes a lot of time, energy, and resources. And, you know, sometimes you have those resources here in Canada. Sometimes you outsource them. Uh, and sometimes you use your global contacts, your global colleagues. But, you know, a lot of work, a lot of investment, even to come to Canada. So, yeah, I would say, you know, you're looking at multi-millions of dollars even to get off the ground here in Canada. And, you know, whether we like this or not, it is a business and we've got to look at return on investment, but even return to break even, you know, thinking about all the costs that come here. So, Sometimes you see where products aren't available in Canada for various reasons, and some might often wonder why, especially in the rare disease space where, uh, you know, there, there may be very few patients, very few treatments, um, and companies will often be leaned upon to bring those in. And sometimes it's not even commercially viable, but there's ethics there, and, and, we, and we often do, do try to bring them in as best we can. Well, there's lots of industry advocacy groups. There's Innovative Medicines Canada, Biotech Canada, Life Sciences Ontario. Um, and, and there's another group that I, I work with, I actually chair, called Rare Eye, and it's Rare Innovators. And this group uh, is 13 companies that primarily work in the rare disease space. And the need for this group to come together was really, you know, we focus on rare diseases. All of us are challenged by the policies in Canada for rare disease patients. So we thought we really need our own voice. We really need to, you know, to find a rare disease policy, find a way from a regulator standpoint or a reimbursement standpoint to, you know, put a policy in place that allows government officials to have a lens to look at rare diseases and rare disease therapies properly. Because right now we don't have that. Um, and the big industry groups are great, certainly uh, well-resourced and do good things. But rare innovators, if we can't have a policy where rare disease products can come here. And we know we're late. We know we're delayed. We know rare disease patients don't do as well here in Canada. So we really need to push that policy. And having a rare disease policy, I think, is important. A different way to approve these drugs and get them put through the system. Because right now, it's not working for patients. When I started as a GM of a rare disease company, you know, I, I was networking with other GMs of rare disease companies. And one of them said to me, you know, being a GM in Canada in rare disease, you're not going to be a star. On the global stage, you're going to really struggle here. You've got to fight for every patient. Funding isn't easy. We don't have a rare disease policy here in Canada. The lens by which, let's say, Health Canada, the regulator looks at these drugs, the way that, you know, the health technology assessment groups look at these drugs, they, ha they have a lens of common drugs. Even the common drug review, it's called the common drug review. So how are they supposed to look at a rare disease drug? And the metrics they use, the measurements they use, it really doesn't lend itself to being very successful at getting 
innovation here for Canadians with rare diseases. And, you know, one thing I've said over the years I've done this is I think Canadians would be mortified if they really knew how rare disease patients and families were treated in this country. Um, I, I did a, a talk at a CORD conference, so Canadian Organization for Rare Disorders, a few years ago. And, you know, I get, gave up and gave a talk about bringing innovation to Canada and some of the challenges of that. And at the end of the conference, there was a QA and a and a mother stood up and was at the microphone and she was directing the question to me and she seemed quite cross. And I thought, oh boy, what, what did I say? What a stupid thing did I say or didn't mean to say? But she said to me, you know, you're in a position of power. You run a drug company here in Canada. She says, I'm just a mother. So you better keep fighting for our patients, fighting for our kids, because we can't do it. You, you're the one that can, can help direct policy. You're the one that can deal with government. So you need to keep doing that. So I, I took that very seriously, that that is part of my responsibility, which is why I spend a lot of my time looking at policy, working on policy, trying to advocate on behalf of rare disease patients, because by nature of rare disease, there's only a few of them. You know, They don't have that big lobbying voice. They don't have that big clout to go into the government and say, we need help here. A lot of people don't understand rare disease, don't understand how patients are treated here. We take great pride in our healthcare system in Canada. And for the most part, it does pretty well. But with rare disease patients, it really doesn't do well at all. So imagine you have a child and this child through a newborn screening test is discovered that they have a rare metabolic genetic disorder that's life-threatening. And fortunately for this family, there's a product out there, a drug out there that's available that arguably could be life-saving. And, and based on the literature, based on the history of this disease, this drug, you know, for all intents and purposes is, is a life-saving medication along with dietary restrictions and so on. Get the newborn screening, you understand there's a treatment and you start working through all of that and the child is doing fine on treatment. And then you get a letter from a government official at a Ministry of Health saying, we're not going to fund the drug anymore. You might want to contact the manufacturer for samples. When I heard that story, I just thought, imagine the stress that that poor mother went through, that family went through, when everybody knows, the doctors know, the nurses know, everybody knows that you need this drug or your child may not live. And the government sends you this insensitive letter saying, we're not going to fund it anymore. The parent didn't do anything. The child didn't do anything. And it was just because of a you know, game that was being played to try to reduce the price of the drug. You know, I, that was so, I was so infuriated by that story. I just thought that is, that's a great example of where, you know, we did not do right as a country by that mother. We, we put her in a situation of absolute stress and anxiety and hoping that the whim of, you know, some drug executive is going to say, yes, I'll allow you, your child to live. So I'm going to give you a free drug. I approve free drug all the time. And unfortunately I have to do this. And sometimes you feel like you're playing God because the government's not going to pay for it. Someone slips through the cracks and there's no other means by which this patient can get the product. So they come to me and say, will you give free drug to this patient? The one this morning for me was someone who did a long-term steroids, high dose steroids. And that's terrible. Degeneration of joints. It's a, everybody knows you're not supposed to be on steroids long. So either I can say, yep, keep that person on steroids or no, you can have my drug for free. So I, I, I don't like being put in that position. It's not fair to me. It's not fair to that family. Um, but that's the system that we rely on. And, and governments sometimes rely on our generosity to give away drug for free. There's no other system by which that can happen. And, you know, I remember in the old days, you know, Canada would be a tier one, tier two kind of country to bring products in. I think we're being relegated to the, you know, tier three, tier four, like Russia or Slovenia, areas like that. Again, we take great pride in our healthcare system, and I don't think we want to be relegated to, to playing in the same, same field as, as those countries that maybe we should be ahead of. So I don't want to sound the alarm, you know, make it sound like it's terrible here in Canada when they might say, well, maybe we should pull back. Maybe we should not bring products there. Maybe we should relegate you to third, fourth, fifth tier country because it's not worth our resources because we don't think we'll get anything back from that. Or uh, it's just too difficult or the timelines are too long or it's too unpredictable. So I try to put on a brave face with them and try to paint a rosy picture, but there's just a lot of uncertainty and that's very challenging. So I almost sometimes feel like I'm putting myself at personal risk <laughs> for my own career when you know I just don't know what's going to happen. And if I can't steward these products into the country, get them into the appropriate patient and make the system work. A lot of small companies don't survive. And, you know, I came in here, we were very small. We had six people, you know, I've done it my best to make sure that we keep this company going here in Canada. And we've got a pretty good future um, as long as, you know, we can get approvals, we can get reimbursement, but that's pretty unpredictable. So I'm hopeful. Our next speaker is Janine Pajot, Vice President Human Resources at Bayer in Canada. Janine will be talking about the evolution of leadership in pharma, fostering a culture of leadership, and how to pursue a leadership role early in your career. I think the past 18 to 19 months through the pandemic have really taught us some vital lessons with respect to leadership and serving our teams accordingly. So 
this applies to pharma, it applies to all levels of leadership. But if we think about pharma in particular, and, and let's focus on the sales force, for example. In the past, prior to COVID, it was a virtual world to begin with. However, through COVID, our teams had to evolve themselves. They went from going to face-to-face -face calls with their customers to having to go to a more digital platform, as we're doing today with those virtual type of connections. So that requires the leader to tap into different tool sets in order to help their team members manage through that shift in mindset. You know, if you have a high performing representative who have all of a sudden gone from having that relationship with face to face with their customers, how does the leader help the employee, help the representative to make that shift to that virtual world so they maintain that connectivity with customers without really missing that beat? What that requires is for the leader to truly be their authentic selves. The days have gone long gone of command and control, though I will admit my mind is always blown when I still hear of this type of behavior in leaders. You know, you have to challenge yourself as a leader. Are you really tapping into the individual? This is not a one size fits all type of moment in terms of leadership. And you really need to identify what is it that makes your employee tick so that you can help them manage through whatever challenges are coming their way and more so help them to really embrace the opportunities ahead. I think probably one of the best and first things a leader can do is just model the behavior that a true leader would possess. Show that authenticity, show that vulnerability, create space within your team, within even your doesn't have to be your immediate direct reports, but just in general within the organization that you welcome challenging conversations, you welcome dialogue, and as well, create a space where failure is not failure, it's an opportunity to grow. It's not terrible. It's a gift because you have fallen down. Think of our childhood. How many how many lessons have we learned by falling down, skinning our knees, you know, learning to ride that bike the first time? It's really imperative that we create that environment where it's okay to fail and embrace it as that growth opportunity for the organization, for the employee. And it also really emphasizes and embraces the psychological safety component for employees. That's so valuable. When they know that their leader will be open to understanding what led to said failure and how we might grow together, then there's that space of feeling like you actually belong, it's a safe environment, and you grow together as a team. And when shaping future leaders, if you have folks who are earlier in their career, create opportunities for mentorship, guide them to create those networks and to tap into diverse networks so that they can understand different perspectives and what have you. But I, I would say first and foremost is model what you want to see in the future. You know, that's just imperative. And the true sense of leader is creating and showing your authentic self. Show that you're vulnerable. It will be not easier, but it will pave the way to create a safe space for people to come forward and have really fruitful dialogue, which helps everyone grow. There are leaders and there are managers. So a manager has their direct reports, follows the book, etc. But are they really tapping into the strengths of their team members to bring out the best that they can and utilizing those skill sets to drive the business further, to drive the organization further, to drive the culture? That's what leaders do. Leaders are there to draw in the respective skills and competencies that each individual member can contribute. So you don't need to be their manager. You don't need to be their boss, so to say, but you are there to, as a, an orchestra leader, think of it that way. And you're there to bring in the wonderful skills that each one offers and to draw it out as well too, because not everybody is an extrovert or what have you. So as a leader, you want to ensure you're listening to everyone, that everyone has a seat at the table and 
as well a voice at the table. So like an orchestra leader, you are there to ebb and flow with ensuring that those skills and those voices are heard. So absolutely, you don't need to be the actual manager in a cross-functional environment. It's probably the truest testament of challenging your leadership skills and in bringing people together for a common purpose and a common goal. And you can do that by tapping into the individuals. The key component for any leader is to establish trust within the team. And that is really the foundation of everything. I personally love the work from Patrick Lencioni, and he draws the model of trust and think of it as a pyramid and you have trust as the foundation, just like a foundation of a house. Without that, you can't even begin to have those really open dialogues about failure, like we just spoke about earlier, Mm -hmm. or having the healthy conflict uh, with business concerns that are on the table. You need to have that together. And that's what a leader's job is, is to build that environment. I think first and foremost is establish a diverse network, a network within your organization but tap into a diverse network outside of your organization. And by diverse, think of it as diversity of thought. And why is that? Because if you surround yourself with the same people, you're going to get the same answers. And in order to really challenge yourself and grow, it's important to meet up with folks who don't think exactly the same way you do and listen. Listen and really reflect on what their point of view is, How does that align to how you're thinking and how might you both grow through the conversation? So networking, if I could tell my younger self, key, really key. Other areas, there's formal mentorship, which is always terrific, but there's informal mentorship as well, which brings me back to the networking component. Try and find yourself someone that you can have those vulnerable dialogues with and feel comfortable to be able to challenge your own thinking, to learn from their own experiences. So it could be a formal mentorship, it could be informal, but nonetheless, really having that confidant is really integral. And I would say the last piece is just be open, do self-reflection, not to the point of beating yourself up, but you know, when things don't exactly go how you planned, do a little think back. How could I have done that a little bit differently? How could I have done that better? And when leading teams, whether it's a formal direct report type of situation, or if it's in a cross-functional, really do that reflection when you're having those interactions with your team members. How might you draw out the best in those people? And what could you be doing differently? Or what could you continue to be doing that has been very successful? Next up, we have Pat Forsyth, General Manager of ESIC. Pat will be discussing company culture across the pharma industry, the importance of real-world evidence, and the need for privacy in the digital age of consumer data. If I look back on my very first company, I was planning on being a lifer. I had no intent of ever leaving. In fact, I was looking at houses in Kalamazoo, Michigan, believe it or not when you know the mergers and acquisitions happen so interestingly for me in that journey you know i've been well trained i've been in large pharma companies with great training so i've had great training through my career and every time i thought i was you know well trained and completely polished in my understanding of the business and patient realities and healthcare in general i'd move to a new company and they would look at it completely differently and i will say every company i've worked with has a different approach and I would realize the blind spots that I had in my last company when I thought, okay, I've got this down. The blind spots would suddenly appear. I think it's made me a stronger leader and a stronger contributor to my company today because I have had all those varied experiences. Culture is the one thing that's interesting through the whole piece. You asked about different cultures in the companies. Your culture can be deliberate or it could be accidental. Your culture will always occur accidentally, whether you do it or not, but you can make it deliberate. What I've learned is I've taken all the good things that I've seen and tried to create a culture at at ASI. You know, it's collaborative, treats people with respect, wants people to have a voice, no penalty environment. It's a place where we like to really challenge each other's ideas and then, you know, see if we can come up with a better product. 
So I've kind of taken all the great things I've seen and put them into where we are today. Last year alone, in breast cancer alone, there was 1,500 publications based on real-world evidence. 1,500 just in breast cancer. So it's out there. It's happening. When I spoke at the NPC meeting, one of the points that I was trying to make was technology is enabling this to happen. And so let's go back to square one. The standard is randomized controlled trials, right? It's the gold standard. You get to reduce the number of variables. You can control the power of the study with the end value. You get to define what the patient characteristics are, and it gives you the best statistical model at the end. Real world evidence is messy. You don't get to control a lot of those things. So historically, you know, regulators have kind of, you know, looked at it with a skeptical eye. It wasn't always accepted as good evidence. But I think even the regulators, the payers, have started to recognize that this is important. So where can it help? I think post-marketing, you can take the study that was done in a very controlled environment and start to watch what's happening in the real world determine, is this drug doing what it's supposed to do? Are there more side effects? Are there better results in certain populations? And we're already seeing that clinicians are changing their practices based on real world publications. So I think it can improve the patient outcomes. It can improve the way patients are treated. It can improve which patients we treat and when we treat them if we start looking at these things. So I think the real beneficiary is the patient. You know, there's possibilities that you could start to expedite approvals. As Canadians, you know, we're very patient and it takes a long time for us to get access to some of these new medications. Could real world evidence improve that? Could we get access a little quicker? I think those opportunities are there and certainly they've been seen in other jurisdictions. So I think it holds great hope. It's not perfect, but it's a way that's coming and I think it's irresistible. It's not just the industry that's doing it. It's clinical groups and clinicians and the number of publications I, that I cited, I think it's out there. So we'll see it for sure. And I think it has a great potential to impact outcomes, which is what we all want. It's kind of the topic of the day, isn't it? With social media and every day you seem to read about a hack somewhere where I always check the morning news feed and say, any of the companies that I work with were hacked and now somebody has my data. I would say when we're talking about privacy and data, it is kind of a sacrosanct. It's in our face every day. You know, your insurance carrier who does your health coverage today, wherever you might work, they've got your personal medical data. They know what you're using. Your doctor has your data. Your bank has your data. And there's definitely risks involved in terms of privacy, but they seem to have figured it out. So my question would be, you know, why would pharma be any different? I think there's risks and we need to, you know, go in eyes wide open, but not to use some of these technologies and capabilities would be a mistake. There's challenges to overcome and we do have to be very careful. But I do think that there's ways to do it and to de-risk that going forward. You know, I would say that if there's one thing I think the pandemic has done, it's brought unlikely bedfellows together. So I think we're closer to common ground with the government and with regulators and with payers than we've ever been. We all know that pharma is not always seen in the best light, but we all have the same goal in mind. We're all trying to improve patient outcomes, trying to give access to better health care for Canadians. And in the end, we know that we add value. It's so disappointing for me that governments don't see that we're actually an economic asset to the country. There's great jobs, you know, highly educated positions available to people. And we do add to the economy. But we're seen as a cost center. I think we're getting closer to bridging that gap with governments, closer than I've ever seen. And my prediction is that I think because of COVID and everything that's happened, that ball has started rolling. And I think we can take advantage of that and actually find some great common ground for the industry, for healthcare, for government, for payers, for everything. But that would be my, my prediction. Our final speaker is David Renwick, Vice President and General Manager of Emergent Biosolutions. David will be talking about dealing with the COVID pandemic and the opioid crisis simultaneously, the benefit of academia and consulting on his career, and the impact of the pandemic on the pharma industry. It's been incredibly challenging, but at the same time, the small wins become very rewarding. Look, the pandemic has tragically worsened 
the opioid overdose crisis. This country has lost 7,200 lives last year due to the opioid overdose crisis, and that works out to approximately 19 people a day. And that's just unacceptable. Were it not for the pandemic, we would probably only be talking about the opioid overdose crisis. But obviously, you know, I think a lot of people, ourselves included, have done a huge job to actually manage both public health crises and continue the good work that we do. But it's really been a challenge because we're not able to be in front of the people that need to know about this. There are a number of communities and, you know, for instance, our First Nations communities right around the country are deeply affected by the opioid crisis, are not getting a lot of the information, not a lot of the awareness. And one of the things that we've been very successful at is working with government stakeholders to really broaden the distribution of Narcan nasal spray to get it to those communities, some of them very, very remote. And suffice to say, those present a number of challenges on their own. So it really has been, it's difficult at the best of times but I, and challenging, but I'll say that uh, we've done a pretty good job despite the immense challenges that came with the pandemic. I think I went on a, a really kind of accelerated learning cycle while I was consulting. But through that work there, I was exposed to dozens upon dozens of companies, both sides of the border, U.S. and Canada. I got exposed to a number of different institutions, practices, policies, regulatory environments. It really added to my breadth of understanding in the marketplace. So it was formative, to say the least. And, you know, I'm very proud of what I accomplished in that. And, you know, were it not for the chance of through really fortunate networking and an old friend of mine whom I was a rep with, he was with a different company in London, Ontario, when we started in our careers. He was working out of the U.S. and he got word that ADAPT was looking for a general manager for Narcan nasal spray and the launch of their company in Canada. And and I was fortunate enough to get that opportunity. And it's something that I'm immensely passionate about and makes the job uh, not so much a job as much as just the, the ability to work in something that you like is pretty motivating. For me, the university experience academically you know, I probably don't use the learnings there as much as I do sort of the other development and social things that came out of my experience in university. And and a big part of that was networking. You know, not only friends that were formed there that are now what I consider lifelong friends, and I'm glad to say there are many. I think it's really the idea that it's, you know, a building block for that network. And Quite honestly, I think a week doesn't go by where I don't tap into that network from my school days. And it's really rewarding in that regard. So it was a very important time in my life. But, you know, there's going to be change inevitably. But I think, you know, a lot of the change that we can't control is going to, in the industry itself, in our ability to respond to that change, I think is really what's going to be pivotal and shape us for the future to come. You know, I think that, for example, I think a lot of folks are questioning whether or not we'll be, you know, face-to-face in kind of a promotional effort and things like that. I'm of the opinion personally that that will always need to be there. It has to be. I think people are people and human beings are human beings, and there'll always have to be a component of that. Having said that, I think this isn't so so different that, you know, technology is going to change the way we continue to interact. So I don't think one replaces the other, but I think how we use those tools and how we apply them in an ever-changing environment is really going to be what's instrumental for us to be successful. Beyond that, I think the industry, I'm certainly no expert and still on a very steep learning curve when it comes to things like AI and things like that that we're starting to talk a lot more about. I think there's bright futures for all of those things. But at the end of the day, What we have to do is to continue to remind people why we do what we do and the purpose of what we do, because that ultimately is going to carry the day. It's the reason that my team and I, I think, have been successful and why we feel very responsible for impacting tens of thousands of lives due to the opioid overdose crisis. And that goes beyond just even the victims of overdose, but even the people that are their families of people that have survived and will live to see another day. 
That's our reason to be. That's what governments need to hear. That's what payers need to hear. That's what all policymakers need to understand. And I said one thing, I'll say this in conclusion, but you know, I said one thing to my team around the holidays this past year, which was, you know, congratulations, we've accomplished so much. And I said, can you imagine a time when we weren't here? The impact would have been devastating to this country and really this continent. So not sure how much that's forward looking per se, but at the same time, I think those are some important tenets as we go forward. All the speakers from this episode will be returning alongside other prominent thought leaders and visionaries from the industry. So mark your calendars for the 16th Annual National Pharmaceutical Congress on November 2nd, 2022. You can register at www.pharmacongress.info. Better yet, use the promo code PODCAST to save $300 on your ticket. We hope you enjoyed today's NPC podcast. If you did, please share it with your colleagues. Find us at Apple iTunes, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. The NPC podcast is presented in cooperation with Imprez, Canada's next generation commercial partner. See everything they have to offer at www.imprez.com. I'm your announcer and podcast producer, Jeremy Visser. Research for this program came from Cristela Tello Ruiz. The musical theme is performed with laser precise mastery by the NPC Podcast Orchestra under the direction of Maestro George Milbrook. We'll be back again next week. Until we speak again, stay safe. <laughs>